We're going to talk now about an incredibly fundamental idea in engaging with the asymptotic behavior of many common estimators. Previously, we've looked at the asymptotics of the sample mean, noting that under mild conditions it converges to the population mean, understanding that rate of convergence, and the sampling distribution suitably centered and scaled. We are now going to show that those ideas apply quite broadly, and that many estimators can be written as something that roughly looks like a sample mean to first order. We saw this previously when we engaged with the sample variance, noting that the sample variance converged to the population variance and suitably centered and scaled had an asymptotically normal limit based on ideas that looked a lot like those employed when looking at the sample mean. We're going to begin by reminding ourselves about asymptotics of the sample mean. Here we imagine we have n observations, z1 to zn, drawn independently and identically from some distribution f on the real numbers. Um, we are going to make the assumption that the variance sigma squared of z under f is finite, less than infinity, and we're going to denote the mean by mu. So um, as a reminder, we use Chebyshev's inequality to prove the weak law of large numbers, which says that the sample mean converges in probability to the true mean as n gets large. And in particular, Chebyshev told us that the distance between the sample mean and the true mean is roughly n to the negative one half. One thing to note, I'm writing this a little differently than we've seen before. Generally, I've written it as z n bar minus mu equals big O p n to the negative one half. And this new notation that I'm using here um, is exactly equivalent to this notation on the right. Um, it's just maybe a nicer way to write it. Here I'm saying the sample mean is equal to the population mean plus some stochastic or probabilistic error or perturbation that is at most on the order of n to the negative one half. From here, the central limit theorem lets us refine things and says if we really zoom in on the sampling distribution of z bar n, the sample mean around mu, the population mean, with magnification square root n, then that sampling distribution converges to a mean zero normal distribution with bounded variance. In this case, the variance is exactly sigma squared, the variance of each individual observation zi. So another way we often think about this that is very informal, um, and we don't use in proofs generally, is we say the sample mean is roughly normally distributed with expectation mu and variance sigma squared over n. And again, this is, this is quite heuristic. Instead, we often use this statement in proofs rather than this statement, as we have not formally defined what that means. But I think for intuition's sake, this bottom statement is much more useful and, and easier to parse than this top statement. All right, now moving on from just thinking about the sample mean as an estimator of the population mean, we also looked at the sample variance as an estimator of the population variance. And when we looked at this, we saw that in fact, the sample variance as an estimator of the population variance kind of behaves like a sample mean or an empirical average, right? And by that, I mean, if we take the sample variance and subtract from it the population variance, we see that this is equal to um, the empirical average of n iid independent and identically distributed mean zero terms minus or plus something that converges to zero um, quite quickly. In this case, something that converges to zero at faster than a rate of n to the negative one half. And why is that important? Well, let's recall that this piece right here converges to zero at almost exactly, or at exactly a rate of n to the negative one half. Um, and so if we have something that converges to zero at exactly a rate of n to the negative one half, plus something that converges to zero at faster than a rate of n to the negative one half, then the asymptotic behavior is dominated by this piece. Now, using this expansion that we calculated before um, and applying Slutsky's theorem, which we, we talked about in, in a previous slide set, we can then show that if we zoom in on this quantity at um, a magnification of square root n, then we have that um, this magnified difference converges in distribution to a normal with mean zero and variance that is exactly the variance of this quantity. That's just another way of saying 
um, this part doesn't matter asymptotically, and we can just apply the central limit theorem directly to this part to get our asymptotic behavior. Right? More heuristically, what this is saying, and again, this is not what we would use in a proof, but it's maybe how we think about things. It says that the sample variance is asymptotically roughly normally distributed with expectation that is the population variance and variance that is the variance of, of this, what we're going to call the influence function as we move forward. Um, and what we did here is going to be the the crux of the idea that we are going to do with lots of different estimators, where we write estimator minus truth as an empirical average of independent and identically distributed mean zero terms, plus something that converges to zero quite quickly so we can just ignore it asymptotically. So now we're going to give a formal definition for this framework that we've been engaging with. So again, that was an example of what we're going to call an asymptotically linear estimator. So more generally, let's imagine again, we have n independent and identically distributed draws from some distribution f. And now we imagine we want to estimate some parameter that here I'm going to call it psi of f. And by psi of f, I just mean that parameter is a functional of our distribution. So um, again, psi is a map that takes in a distribution and returns, say, a number. Um, previously, that number was the population mean that is a functional or a function of the distribution. Um, we also just looked at when psi of f was sigma squared, the variance of the distribution. And as we change f, that sigma squared can potentially change. So again, moving forward, we're often going to work in this sort of um, functional way where we write parameters as map psi apply to distributions or distribution functions f. So again, given this parameter psi of f, um, if we have an estimator psi hat of n, this is a function of our data, we will call it asymptotically linear or an asymptotically linear estimator for psi if we have a representation that looks a lot like that representation we have for the sample mean or for the sample variance. So if we look at estimator minus truth, right, right here, um, and can write that as an empirical average of what are going to be mean zero terms, plus something that is asymptotically negligible, that converges to zero at a rate faster than n to the negative one half. Um, in that case, we call this estimator asymptotically linear. So here, this function psi of f is a function that can be based on our distribution f, but it should be mean zero. And ideally, in order for this to have good properties, it should also have bounded variance. This function is known as the influence function. It's an extremely important function and, and concept that we will engage with repeatedly. And I guess I should say it is the influence function for our estimator psi hat f. This influence function idea was first developed for use in robust statistics when we are thinking about the effect of an outlier on an estimator. However, since we have noted that influence functions are really useful for proving asymptotic results about estimators and actually for identifying which of a collection of estimators are more or less efficient. So let's look at this in, in two examples that we have seen before. So let's start with the sample mean for estimating the population mean. Here we can write sample mean minus population mean is equal to, and here it's an empirical average of, again, zi minus mu. Each of these is, is expectation zero. Um, and we don't even have any, this is often called a remainder term out here. In this case, we have an exactly linear estimator as opposed to an asymptotically linear estimator. Um, but an exactly linear estimator is in fact also an asymptotically linear estimator. Um, and the influence function here, phi of z is z minus mu. So just to note, um, phi of z in this case does depend on f because we have this mu in here, which is a function of f. As the distribution function changes, mu may also change. In this case, this is the parameter of interest, but sometimes we will have other pieces in here, nuisance parameters, um, functions of f that are not the exact parameter we're trying to estimate. And we'll see an example of that next. So we also looked at the sample variance as an estimator of the population variance. And here, if we look at estimator minus truth, as we saw before, we can write this as an empirical average 
of these sort of derived terms plus this asymptotically negligible term. And so here we would say, okay, the sample variance is an asymptotically linear estimator of the population variance with influence function phi of z equals z minus mu squared minus sigma squared. And in this influence function, we note that we both have the population variance and the population mean. Here, the population variance is in fact the parameter of interest and the population mean would be treated as a nuisance parameter. Right? It's another parameter that is in this expansion, but is not the parameter we were initially trying to estimate. We will see that we will have to estimate these nuisance parameters when we're engaging with confidence intervals using asymptotic linearity. I wanted to jump the gun a little bit and give two more exciting examples, perhaps, that we haven't looked at before. But just to note that asymptotic linearity comes up all over the place. So let's imagine that rather than the mean of a distribution, we are interested in estimating the median of the distribution. And let's imagine we estimate the median of the distribution M with the sample median, the median of the samples that we, we drew. In fact, you can show that the sample median is asymptotically linear for estimating the population median. And um, you can get an expansion that looks like this, an empirical average of mean zero terms plus this asymptotically negligible remainder. Um, it's a little bit involved to show this, but we may engage with this later. And here we have all sorts of interesting stuff in this influence function. We have the median. We have this sine function that returns plus one, minus one, or zero, plus one if zi minus mu is greater than zero, minus one if it's less than zero, and zero if it's exactly equal to zero. And we also have the density of our distribution f evaluated at each observation z. So um, in this case, there is a condition that f has a continuous density. One could use this representation, in fact, to then show that the sample median is consistent for the population median, and in addition, when suitably centered and scaled, has an asymptotically Gaussian limit. Another example that we're going to engage with much more in the future is thinking about regression estimators. And here I'm imagining a scenario where our independent and identically drawn observation z are actually pairs, an x-y pair where x is a feature, y is an outcome, and we're trying to estimate um, either the true linear relationship between x and y or the population best linear relationship if we don't imagine there is a true linear underlying relationship between x and y. Then one can actually, um, without too much work, show that the difference between estimated line of best fit and true population line of best fit um, similarly has this asymptotically linear form. We have this empirical average of expectation zero terms, and we have some negligible second order remainder. Right, And so one could use this as well to then show that the um, regression estimator does have an asymptotically Gaussian limit, is consistent, etc. So these are slightly more involved examples. And again, we haven't really given the background on these, but probably you've run into these in, in applied statistics at various points. And I think it's very interesting to note that many, essentially all of the standard estimators that we use in applied statistics can have their asymptotic theory worked out via this idea of asymptotic linearity. And in addition, that can be used for, say, calculating asymptotic confidence intervals. So I, I hinted at this as we were going, but if we have an asymptotically linear estimator for a parameter, then under really mild moment conditions, essentially that the variance of the influence function is finite, we have that if you take our estimator, center it, subtract off the true parameter, and scale it up by square root of n, then that um, scale difference converges in distribution to a Gaussian that is mean zero um, with variance that is exactly the variance of the influence function. So again, we need that variance to be finite. And this is shown using exactly the technique employed before to understand the asymptotic distribution of the sample variance around the population variance. And this is a little bit technical intuitively, but again, very informally, what's going on? Well, it says that our, our sample estimator is roughly asymptotically normally distributed around the population 
parameter that it's trying to estimate with variance that is roughly the variance of the influence function divided by the number of observations. So again, for intuition, definitely we want to engage with this. For formal proof, we want to engage with this statement up here. I think that this idea of asymptotic linearity is really one of the strongest techniques um, in our toolbox for proving normality of estimators. And often in more classical texts, they don't talk about asymptotic linearity. What they do is they do a ton of calculations and then they like cite Slutsky's theorem um, and cite the central limit theorem. And basically under the hood, they're using exactly the same idea. They're just being tricky about it in the proof. And I think it's often really useful to spell out precisely what is going on in this asymptotic linearity language. In addition, and I think this part is really neat, given that setup from the previous slide where psi hat n is an asymptotically linear estimator for, for psi, then we can actually form an asymptotic confidence interval exactly the same way that we did when we were engaging with the sample mean and the population mean. So um, what do we need? We need a consistent estimator of the variance of the influence function. And if we have that, then this interval, which is centered at our sample estimator, using a width that is determined by the variance of the influence function or our estimate thereof, um, the number of observations, and the corresponding quantiles of a Gaussian, this interval will have asymptotically correct coverage. And essentially the argument for that is exactly the argument that we engage with when using asymptotic normality to build an asymptotic confidence interval for the population mean around the sample mean, right? Because this is asymptotically something like an empirical average or a type of sample mean of derived observations. Again, we can employ identical techniques to what we used before. But we're going to talk about this in a little bit more depth shortly. So just as a quick recap, we talked about this idea of asymptotically linear estimators for population parameters. We noted that the sample mean was an exactly linear estimator of the population mean, and thus also an asymptotically linear estimator. The sample variance is an asymptotically linear estimator of the population variance, and we mentioned a couple of others, including the sample median for the population median um, and the sample line of best fit for the population line of best fit. Again, we noted that all of these are asymptotically linear estimators, and then we saw that for asymptotically linear estimators, we have some really nice asymptotic results. Right? We have that they converge in probability to whatever parameter they're trying to estimate. We have that that convergence follows at a rate of roughly 1 over square root of n. And in fact, we know that that sampling distribution of that estimator around the true parameter it's trying to estimate um, is asymptotically normally distributed. As a final piece, we mentioned that we can use that to form confidence intervals, though we'll go into that in more detail shortly.